we looked at several things on the last uh, two, uh, two days. Uh, that the Blue Note preacher is the prophet of the modern age, I would say. Uh, she is the person staring in the darkness, finding God's image while others only can see despair. On Wednesday, we framed this Blue Note idea, and yesterday we demonstrated the double entendre in Blue Note preaching uh, through call and response. But today, we want to look at the challenge of postmodern culture to preaching and methods inherent in bebop, hip hop, and even the blues that allows us to speak to a postmodern and post soul men and women. Uh, there was a film uh, that came out a few years ago uh, by James Cameron uh, by the name of Avatar. It's one of the highest grossing films in history, poignantly displays the clash of cultures, uh, faith communities with modern society. And for those who've not seen the film, it is the retelling of the old story of manifest destiny and colonialism. A planet far away from Earth, rich with resources, is being colonized by humans. Uh, to exploit the resources, yet the planet is inhabited by an agrarian, highly spiritual community of people known as the Navi. And what is striking about the story is the Navi, the traditional pastoral community, is completely computer generated. The bringers of technology, human beings, are live actors. The film puts the clash of culture, colonialisms, and the dangers of profit and destructive potential of technology on full display while using the latest form of technology to share a parable, a simple parable about humanity's spiritual emptiness uh, and need to return to basic spiritual principles. I'd like to raise this question that, uh, that Leonard Sweet has already done. Avatar really raises a question about native and immigrant culture. The clash that we are experiencing is the clash between digital natives and analog immigrants. Digital culture can be defined for our purposes as anyone born in the 1970s or later who's defined their entire life by technological changes of binary codes of zeros and ones. Uh, are, these are natural cultural extensions, and this affects the way that we look at homiletics and preaching. Analog culture uses wave technology, the predominant technical format since the turn of the century uh, has radically changed as a result of these binary code, codes. The creation of mobile phones, personal computers, GPS, all throughout this extension of technology. Now, now what I want to do is just give everybody up in here a test right now. Real simple test to find out if you're analog or if you're digital, all right? So if you ever owned a 78, a 45, or a 33, raise your hand, raise your hand. You're straight up analog, just want to let you know that, all right? If you ever called an audio device a hi-fi, raise your hand. Analog, you're analog up in here. If you ever purchased an 8-track tape, uh-huh, tell the truth, yeah, yeah, analog. If you mailed a handwritten letter in the last two months, you are straight up analog. Hey Amen. You looked up a number in the phone book. Oh, wow, wow, analog, analog. You pay your bills online. Hey Amen, digital. If you lost your cell phone, you would not know the number to your own house. <laughs> you are definitely digital. Losing your cell phone is worse than losing your wallet. It is my contention the major changes within the world and faith community are, are not recent, but part of a glacial shift, a rapid technology shift. The interesting thing is, is that, that what we're experiencing preaching is this major shift is really about digital and analog culture clashing with each other. Wave analog technology is not mobile. Digital technology is mobile. Digital and analog culture can be defined as mobile and stationary. And I would make the, even the contention that there are biblical elements that are digital and there are biblical elements that are analog because what is digital is always now mobile. What is analog means that you have to come to the device, whereas in digital culture, the device comes to you and goes wherever you are. 
And I would argue that uh, Moses was in what would call, one would call has digital elements to the operation dealing with the Ark of the Covenant, with jo uh, uh, jo uh, Joshua, when the Ark of the Covenant would move across the plain of the desert. You moved where God said move. That's a digital movement right there. But with the creation of a temple, all of a sudden people came to the temple. And it had an analog element where people then had to come to worship versus worship being wherever the people are. And Jesus remixes and moves from this analog idea back to digital. Instead of you coming specifically someplace, wherever I am also the Spirit of God lies. And I not appropriate architecture, I utilize the architecture of God to become the worship space. So where does Christ worship? Christ worships outside. There is no better place to worship than looking at the canopy of heaven. And so the changes in worship with this radical person by the name of Jesus who begins to emphasize mobile culture all over again. I would even make the argument that, that Jesus is the original person to tweet. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, hashtag son of God. <laughs> But all of a sudden, he is giving things that are easily can be replicated because of the focus on oral culture. That I've got to pass something on to you so you can pass it on to someone else. It's not text-based. That there is a major difference between the framing of Jesus and the framing of Paul. Paul, who I would say, yes, he had a mobile app known as Epistles that he would pass on. But the thing is that there is a difference between a rural framework and an urban framework. And Jesus is operating out of this rural framework, and then Paul is operating out of an urban framework that has been framed in many ways by Roman culture. But this particular shift in the Christian tradition that has affected preaching really shifts in 1439 with the Gutenberg Bible. The Gutenberg Bible, yes, democratizes faith to a degree. Yes, it does. But at the same time, it also says that there are certain people who own it. That if I am now literate, I now tell you what is in this book. And that was the challenge for those who've been kissed by nature's son who came upon these shores in North America. Someone was telling them, yes, this is what it means. And that is the brilliance of Howard Thurman's grandmother who says, I like what Jesus says, but I got problems with that Paul guy. <laughs> that I don't want to read anything what Paul says. I want to stick to what Jesus says. And so the Gutenberg moment shifts the way that we even view culture and even preaching today. And there is now this analog and digital challenge and I, and I want to give another test. I gave you this early digital test, but I want to give you a different test because part of the challenge in the homiletics is that we get so caught up on a particular methodology that there is only one way to preach. And that is not the truth. There are multiple ways in which someone can communicate, embody the word of God, and pass that on to someone else. Don't ever idolize or deify a method. There are multiple ways in which someone can communicate. Let me, let me see if I can break it down. I did the digital test before, but let me break it down this way. How many people here actually remember music on a 78? Raise your hand. Throw your hands up. Where are my 45 people up in here? Throw your hands up. All right. Where are my 33 people? 33. Amen. 33. And where, where, where are my LP folks up in here? LP. There we go. All right. Where are the 8-track people? Don't, don't be scared. Raise your hand. You still have eight tracks. We're the cassette, side A, side B. Kevin, raise your hand. I know, amen. All right, now, now where are my CD folks up in here? Where are my MP3 people up in here? My Spotify, my Pandora, my digital people up in here? The beautiful thing is, is what is interesting is that you have all of these different methodologies, but we can play the song Amazing Grace on a 78, a 45, a 33, an eight track, a cassette, a CD, a DVD, an MP3. It's the same song, different method of delivery. But the problem is, is we have eight track churches in an MP3 world and we're wondering why we cannot reach a new generation because we have have deified the method. Now let me see if I can break this down just a little bit. That when you utilize different methodologies, they're, they're going to play for us Amazing Grace. Wayne and Maggie, they're going to they're hook this thing up. 
Uh, Wayne is going to, well, actually, Maggie, why don't, you, why don't you start? You got the acoustic, so hook it up there. Now, we're going to merge traditions. We're going to take acoustic and electrified and let them play together. Different methodologies of playing, two different styles of playing, but, but they come together and there's something beautiful that happens. They're playing the same theme, the same song, but from two different perspectives. And when homiletics, when preaching recognizes that we don't deify a method, that what you bring to the table, God honors, that God blesses, that God anoints, then all of a sudden we can take acoustic and electrified and bring them together. We can take piano and Hammond and they can play together. All of a sudden you begin to create a Creole moment where we begin to bring the best of the elements that we bring from our own table and we create something new. And that is what's unique about the American project. We are always creating something new broken shards and pieces of people's lives, something is created that is so unique and powerful. And that is what I love about Blue Note preaching is because it is translatable. It is the rule of American culture. Don't you know that jazz cannot swing without the blues? The gospel cannot shout without the blues. Soul cannot croon and rock cannot roll unless there is the blues. Pop will never reach the charts without a blues basis. Blues, gospel, jazz, R&B, and hip hop have these particular elements to it. This small piece of rue known as the blues. And digital culture inf informs blue note homiletics. And so we have digital natives and we have uh, those who are analog immigrants. What, what do we do? Because also there is this clash between a Gutenberg culture and a Google culture. And so you have these two elements that are now fighting and dealing with dominance because we want dominance. No, we don't want dominance. We want partnership. And Google culture and, and analog culture are dealing with this. And it is Dwight Friesen and Leonard Sweet and a computer scientist that I studied by the name of Matthew Dickerson who gives us a glimpse into what digital faith 
has to offer the analog community. The first thing that, that digital culture does that is unique, that also flows out of the blues uh, sensibility, is what is known as an open source community. That's, that's what I like about Google. I, I'm, I'm an Apple fan, but I really like uh, the way Google flows. I just like the way they do things, and it's known as open source. Open source means that I will give you the program so that you can add to the program. So in other words, that if you like Google Maps, it was somebody that said, you know what, we need a map program, so I'm going to create a map program uh, for me and for my friends. And eventually that is added into the larger program. In other words, everyone is allowed to contribute. And the beautiful thing is, is that this idea of open source flows out of the blue sensibility, which is really the jazz motif of understanding how worship and preaching work together. So let me break it down so you understand what I'm saying, that, that the jazz motif is what I believe that when we bring that to the element of preaching and also of worship, something unique happens. Because the power of jazz is that jazz does something that many other pieces of composition do not do. Jazz says everybody has the right to solo. Even though you may have a different instrument coming from a different perspective, you have the right to solo. And what I love about jazz is that the bass never tells the drum, you got to sound like me. That I come out of my own unique perspective and the sound that I bring to the table is something that develops the entire sound and we work on this together. And so the drum gets to solo. But what is unique about it, even in a jazz band, it is the bringing together of African and European elements. So how now you have that, a saxophone, which actually comes out of the marching band element, but also brought out of chamber music of the French tradition. Then you have a bass, but I'm playing the bass line, but then polyrhythms that come out of the African tradition. All of these elements coming together as they do out of New Orleans, and that each element says that you have the right to solo. And the beautiful thing about jazz is that jazz taught democracy to America when America didn't even know what democracy was. <laughs> and so the power of this is also what must happen in worship because we are not operating with a jazz motif. We are operating a motif where the composer has already structured everything that will happen in worship. But you've got to have a jazz moment every once in a while where the spirit can show up and all of a sudden somebody can solo in the midst of worship. Now, now, I didn't know how they were going to play today. That was a jazz element of worship right there. That all of a sudden they were doing something unique, didn't practice, but guess what? The spirit moved in such a way and they brought their elements together. Didn't you see Professor Maggie? She went in turning that head right there. She, she was going in. She was going in. And Wayne, you know, he's got to close his eyes. And all of a sudden, he begins to get thoughts of B.B. King moving into his spirit as he begins to play. All of that happening in the midst of the moment. And that is what we miss because there is power when we do this together. But the challenge is for those who are millennials. Is that those who we do not want to communicate to? We don't want to talk with millennials or what I like to say, the, the post-soul generation. The post-soul uh, generation is defined in many different ways because we are post-soul. If I were to use uh, African-American music as a marker to understand where we are culturally as a community and as a people, we are in a post-soul moment. This uh, idea, this particular statement was created by a writer by the name of Nelson George who used to write for The Village Voice. And post-soul means that we are no longer in the soul era. Aretha Franklin, before she sang Respect, that was soul music. Sam Cooke, before he sang You Send Me, sang with a gospel group called The Highway You Sees, that's soul music. Marvin Gaye, before he said What's Going On, was singing in a storefront Pentecostal church, that's soul music. But when you begin to talk about Kendrick Lamar, you begin to talk about uh, Jay-Z, you are now talking post-soul, yeah. that we are in a post-soul moment. But it is hip-hop that I believe this particular vibe that gives us a better understanding of how are we to engage in a post-modern era. So, so let me break it down. I'm going to give you a quick hip-hop lesson. I know I'm in Marquand Chapel, but let me break it down so you have some hip-hop right now. 
that, that hip hop does not begin 10 years ago, it does not begin 20, 30, it is now over 40 years ago, uh, down in the South South Bronx, a brother by the name of Cool DJ Herc. He did not have the money for guitars, didn't have enough money for drums, he didn't have enough money for a saxophone, but his father had a bunch of James Brown records. And he took those records and took two turntables and utilized his creativity and his imagination to find the break beat. So I don't have enough records, so I have to create a new song. So I find new rhythms, and in the process, I take two turntables and I keep the party rocking in the process. And so from 1971 to 1979, hip hop was an underground phenomenon operating mostly on the East Coast where DJs, people using their unique musical skills to be able to create something new, it was known specifically in adolescent communities on the East Coast. But something happened in 1979, Kevin, that changed everything for hip hop. There was a group in Harlem in an area called Sugar Hill, mm. called the Sugar Hill Gang. Sugar Hill, the same place where Zora Neale Hurston used to spend her nights, the same place where Langston Hughes used to spend time, the same place of the Harlem Renaissance writers used to spend time in Sugar Hill. And out of Sugar Hill comes this group, the Sugar Hill Gang, Rapper's Delight. I know you don't know the song, I'm not gonna quote it. I said a hip hop, no, I'm not gonna quote it, I'm not gonna quote it, I'm not gonna quote it. Um, but that Rapper's Delight then becomes the first national particular engagement of this new form uh, that borrows from the griot tradition of Africa of communicating and giving meaning to people who are operating within a deindustrialized urban landscape. Ah, and then 79, it goes national. And then in 1982, another group called Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five begin to create a prophetic perspective of how to communicate in the world. Now, remember that hip hop is the first cultural creation that does not explicitly come out of the church. Blues is connected to spirituals. If you want to be able to sing gospel, you have to know the blues. Uh, gospel is connected to the church. Obviously, jazz is connected to the church. Yes, R&B, rhythm and blues, soul music, all deeply connected. But hip-hop was standing outside of the church looking in the window because no one was raising questions about poverty and deindustrialized urban landscapes like New York and L.A. and other places. So it was young people who then became the griot to be able to speak prophetically when preachers said, we will not speak. And so that is what happens. It's birthed out of that particular narrative. But what does this have to say in terms of preaching? Well, I believe that if you take the four pillars of hip hop, that you all of a sudden now have a narrative and a framing for preaching. There are four pillars of hip hop. For those who may not know it, that, that they're hip-hop studies. You can look at Tricia Rose, who's done an incredible book. Her dissertation was entitled Black Noise, which is probably the finest history of hip-hop culture that has been produced. Talks about the four elements of hip-hop. One element is graffiti. Another element is breakdancing. Another is DJing. And another is rapping. Now, it just went over everybody's head trying to figure out what in the world does graffiti have to do with preaching. But graffiti really is uh, aesthetic expression, is the appropriation of space. As a matter of fact, uh, graffiti has been operating in the church for quite some time. It's called stained glass. That which was street art has then been elevated to art that we now say is sacred. That which could not be shown because Caesar was considered to be the son of God now has been elevated to that which is considered to be sacred. So it's the artistic expression of the appropriation of space because space also preaches, which means that the preacher must be cognizant of the space in which they preach. And so that particular element, that pillar of aesthetic also speaks to this, but also breakdancing. You're like, wait a minute, no one will spin on their head in the church? 
Oh, no, 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 this is not. This is about movement and kinetic energy. The idea that the utilization of one's body, that you can express things with your body that you cannot with words. Mm -hmm. And that if you want God to completely use you, God, as we talked about the other day, is the embodiment. Let your preaching be embodied, however that may be. And so there is this kinetic energy, there is this aesthetic appropriation, and then DJ. And someone is trying to figure out, do we now replace the organ with the DJ? I'm not necessarily saying that, but what I am saying is the appropriation of technology. There was a time where there were no pipe organs in the church. That was the appropriation of technology. And now we have an opportunity to appropriate technology once again. The utilization of technology to be able to communicate a message. That is, again, another pillar of hip hop. And then finally, rapping, which again is just oral dexterity, rhetorical proficiency, how you spit your lyrics when you communicate. And that is these particular pillars give us a framework of how we are to engage liturgically and how we are to gauge homiletically. The embodiment, the space, the appropriation, and the rhetorical proficiency of the person who is communicating. To communicate so that people understand. Post-soul preaching uh, and designs uh, sermons uh, that have a post-soul liturgy. And Blue Note preaching is, uh, it makes the demands of post-soul uh, culture to create a 360 liturgical narrative. So what is this 360 thing? It means that everybody learns differently. There are some people in your congregation, as my friend uh, D. Daryl Griffin says, he says there are some head folk, and they want something that is broken down in a very uh, didactic way. Uh, then there are some uh, heart folk. You've got to tell some stories. And then there's some gut folk. They want you to move from the page. But they are all in the same sanctuary, which means you have to be a student of the people in your sanctuary. You must understand how they can, so you cannot be married to one way of communication because you may not reach them with that form of communication. Or you may have to bring someone in that communicates in a different way. And that is the power of blue note sensibilities, but also the utilization of what I call the jazz methodology of preparation. Jazz is structured around the blues. Gospel is structured around the blues. Blues is birthed from spirituals and work songs and call and response narrative of the church. This methodology builds new music around the theme of bending notes and flatting the fifth and returning to the theme on an appropriate beat. This form of preaching, when you use a jazz methodology, Kenyon, is dangerous. The blue note preacher is prepared to take a risk. Jazz musicians and musicians who dare to use an improvisational narrative take a risk every time. Jazz is dangerous because it dares to create a new composition while playing the old. Right in front of people, something new is created. The musician dares to look behind the new door and find a gift God has left right behind the door. We call it improvisation, the call and response, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the, in charge of the liturgical preparation and homiletical proclamation. That we are called to prepare diligently. But since Blue Note preaching demands the embodiment of an experiential outcome, I must be open to risk leaving what I prepared. Not saying I'm going to leave at this moment. No, 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 no. It means that there may, you must be sensitive to the moment to when you must make a shift. Yes. Sensitive to the moment when you must make a shift because you may miss an opportunity to communicate clearly to someone who needs to hear that which has been given to you. I had an experience with this very unique and, and powerful way. I've been doing a particular series and I worked on a series doing uh, uh, this whole series that we were working on. There was one uh, in this line of messages that I was doing 
I was going to do talking about David. Uh, preachers talk about David all the time. Uh, he's one of the favorite people that we like to talk about. But I want to talk about David. It was, it was, it was uh, placed on my spirit to talk about David from a different perspective. In first person, number one. But number two, to talk about David as a failure as a father. To talk about that we love to lift him up as this great political leader. But what would David say? to men in Chicago? What, what would David say to those on the south side that he gave his entire life for the kingdom and he destroyed his family? What would he say that, that, that Absalom and Amnon actually learned their behavior from him? What, what, would, what would he say that his daughter never talked to him and he never spoke up for Tamar? Prepared, I prepared, I prepared for weeks and weeks, wrote this thing out and had a script together and all, all of this. But it was incumbent that I knew that it could never be read exactly as it was written. It was very clear that you must embody David. You must invite David. You must know the smell of the kingdom. You must understand his thoughts, that you must become David. And I remember preaching that and it was a strange experience that at one moment that my eyes welled up in tears as David was talking about his child and his failures and that David was sharing from his childhood that his daddy didn't even think he could be anointed to be king and how that continues to walk with you all through the entire message, allowing David to speak. And in that improvisational moment, what, what was unique was there was a 12-year-old young man who came up to me and said, David, you talked about my family. Didn't refer to me as Pastor Moss, Reverend O, but David. And then a 20-year-old young man came over and said, thank you for explaining what happened in my house. The embodiment, the embodiment of that which God has placed before us. The improvisational moment had everything laid out, but being sensitive to what was happening at that moment what God calls us to do. And one of the great improvisational blue note moments in American history was Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech yes. that he had prepared very well. We, we love that close, but he did not prepare that close. He stood on the mall in D.C. and was sensitive to that moment. And in that particular moment, as he stood on the wall, he said, I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. And then continued with that refrain that we so deeply love, I have a dream. But it was a remix because he heard a sister by the name of Dr. Prathia Hall win use that narrative and in the most midst of that particular moment reappropriated that remix and so Dr. King was remixing back and forth as he was speaking at that time and presented that to the world and now it echoes in the consciousness of the American project all from an improvisational moment jazz methodology absolutely brilliant and Jesus preaches with these jazz elements. He's always being confronted. Uh, and then those improvisational moments, whether it is someone touching the hem of a garment or meeting a man with many demons. Improvisation is not uh, an art exclusive to jazz, blues, or uh, African-inspired North American traditions. If one looks even at the kinetic brilliance of basketball and soccer, you then get an idea of how improvisational excellence is developed. Any type of transition game, 
Basketball demands skills, uh, skill and knowledge of the game, understanding the dynamics and ebb and flow of the game. Yet, it is a game that is open to improvisation and acts of imagination other sports can only dream of. And my son, Elijah, he's something else. This gentleman has heart. He stands so tall at 5'2". <laughs> but you would think he's 6'10". Talk stuff to everybody. Looking up at one of his mentors, uh, Julian Gaines, who's 6'6", six, six, he says, I can take you. <laughs> He's got heart. And I shared my knowledge of the game with him, my love of the game. We spend time practicing. He practices his solo, his dribble left, his dribble right, left, behind his back, no look pass. And he's always studying the greats of the game. So he knows about Magic, also LeBron and Michael, Maya Moore, Larry Bird, Bill Russell, Jason Williams, Chris Paul, Kyrie Irving, and Jason Kidd. The list goes on and on. He fails most of the time as he's practicing these particular moments because he never knows if he'll have an opportunity to use them in a game. He's not stuck on the textbook X's and O's. He's working his craft like a jazz musician and a blue note preacher. He's preparing for a solo that may never come. But the beauty is he's preparing for the solo. He believes that at some point I'm gonna have the opportunity. Even though every day in the backyard I fail. But if I triumph one time, one time is good enough for me. So I will work this particular piece. No matter, so I'm gonna practice. He has me out there, I have a broom, I hold it up so that he can shoot over somebody who's seven feet tall. So he can practice, so I'm ready. Even though I'm 5'2", I can take you out, you seven feet. <laughs> he has heart. But then I realized he had a methodology of how preaching should be prepared. You need to prepare. You need to study the greats. You need to look at them. And you will fail most of the time in your preparation. But that one time, that God and the Spirit move in such a way that put things together when all of a sudden, boom, three points, you got it. <laughs> God will do that every once in a while. It is in the failure of the preparation that one begins to develop and become the preacher God wants you to be. You become great in your failures over and over and over and over and over. Flunk will visit the pulpit with you and hang out and spend time talking to you, telling you you need to leave the pulpit. But keep working your solo, yeah. just as it is in basketball, it is the same in soccer. That Pele's beautiful scissors kick is not something you learn from your coach. You learn that as you use your imagination and you're working day to day as a child. The jazz method of blue note preaching challenges us to do the work. We're called to study the craft, develop your own voice. If we are to improve our homiletical ability, we must study those out of our tradition. Yes. Here it is. If all you study are people in your own denomination, ethnic background, gender orientation, racial classification, or educational pedigree, you will limit your gifts. You have to study beyond that which you are comfortable. And be able to, not that you are going to become just like that person, but to learn those particular gifts and study. And my son taught me that. He was studying Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He wasn't alive when Kareem was playing, but he's studying Kareem and Bill Russell because he wants to know the greats. He wants to understand the greats. Can you imagine someone saying, I refuse to listen to study Stevie Wonder because he plays music by ear? Can you imagine someone saying, I will not study Woody Guthrie because he did not graduate from college? Uh, can you imagine someone saying, I will not study James Baldwin because he is gay? Can you imagine someone saying, I will not study Toni Morrison because she does not have a PhD in literature? Let me give you an example of Ah, the brilliance, the brilliant person, a brilliant person who helps us understand the blues and jazz aesthetic of study and preparation. And I believe I'm the first person 
in the history of Yale Divinity School to utilize this person in a Beecher lecture. Well. And this particular person who lets us understand study and preparation is a brother by the name of James Brown. I know some of y'all look at me like, how does James Brown end up in this lecture? I'm about to break it down so you understand. <laughs> the James Brown is the best example of congregational exegesis. James Brown, the godfather of soul, is the greatest exegetical practitioner of organic kinetic sensibilities. In other words, James Brown knows how to teach people how to get funky even when they don't know what getting funky is all about. James Brown, raised in Augusta, Georgia, influenced by the pentatonic rhythms of the House of Prayer founded by Marcelo Manuel de Garcia, uh, better known as Daddy Grace. This music was a form of blues influenced by West Africa tonal traditions, pentatonic music of Africa and Eastern Europe, clap on the upbeat. James Brown recognized the difficulty of many Americans who were unfamiliar with pentatonic traditions to dance to music designed on the upbeat. He decided to change the structure from the upbeat to the downbeat, yeah. giving wider access to mainstream America. His exegesis of the audience gave wider appeal to his music. He was still funky, but he changed when the beat would begin allowing a new wave of disciples to be trained in the art of rhythm and blues. This simple idea expressed the need for the preacher to exegete your context, congregation, and your space. If your goal is to communicate, why wouldn't you want to know where the people are? Stop asking them to climb up with you and get out of the pulpit and be with them. Ah, it was, it was interesting if I share my own particular story that there was someone who was trying uh, to school me in terms of how I'm to present at Yale. They're like, Otis, you talk fast and you, um, you, like, you move around a lot. You can't do that. You need to stand there like this and just read very quickly and, and just do that. And I said, I, I can't do that um, because that wouldn't be me. There's nothing more deadly in preaching than when you're inauthentic. Yes, say that, say that. Be who you are. No one can be a better you than you. There's nothing wrong with studying other people, but learn to find your voice. It takes time to find your voice. I'm still trying to find my voice. We do it over time, we continue it in the words of Howard Thurman that God places a crown above our heads. We spend the rest of our lives growing tall enough to where we will spend a lifetime trying to find our voice. But in preparation, I believe that uh, the James Brown teaches, the jazz methodology gives us, read scripture simply. Learn how to read it out loud. Read it with different dynamics, pauses and inflections. Close your eyes, imagine the context, people, sounds and colors. Um, imagine these things and begin to paint pictures in your head. Close your eyes, imagine the moment uh, you are to preach, envision yourself in the act of what God is doing with you. God never arrives because of us. God arrives in spite of us. We are the worst instruments to communicate the holy. It is Gardner Taylor in his Beecher Lectures, he would say that the foliage of Connecticut is better uh, equipped to communicate the gospel than the voice of someone who is human. Uh, but yet, God trusts us. It would be better for a sunrise to talk about the beauty of God than myself or anyone in this room. It would be better for a tree to communicate the beauty of God than us. But God trusts us, and that is what Taylor said is the foolishness of preaching. That God would t use somebody who does not have the capacity to fully communicate and is so deeply broken. But it is in these moments when you take that which you have and you give it unto God. Because when you give it unto God, God will do something unique and new in the process. 
If I may just simply give you this particular story as I close down here for these lectures, I thank you. But Monica and I, we love going to, to, to New Orleans. We love the NOLA. Uh, we are fans of New Orleans and everything about New Orleans. And we were walking along the streets in the French Quarter, and there was a gentleman who was painting in this store. And we decided to go into this store, and he was, you know, they, people in New Orleans love to talk to you, and they always have a story. And so he, we were in there and looking at the paintings that he had. They were beautiful and wonderful. And we were asking about the cost of some of them. And he had these interesting jazz paintings of different people and whatnot. And he was saying, I can paint anything that you want. I said, well, how much are these over here? He said, those are $20. I said, that's a good price for this large piece of canvas. How much are these over here? He said, oh, those are $1,500. And I was looking at it. I said, now, it's the same artist. I'm trying to figure out why the price difference, $20 over here, $1,500 over here. He said, oh, these I painted, the ones over here God designed. I said, please explain that to me. <laughs> I said, well, you have to understand that I, I did the work on these paintings right here. But God gave me uh, an assignment that I would then paint something. Uh, and while the paint was fresh, God would tell me to take the painting while the painting is still fresh and wet with paint and take it out into a storm and leave it out in the storm. And when the storm beats on the canvas, something unique will be created in the process. So take that which you have. Take it into the storm. Do not put before the people just who you are. Take your gifts and give it to God. Let God utilize those gifts and God will beat upon the canvas of your spirit and create something new that has never been created before. Take your spirit and your soul into the storm. And God will create a blue note perspective that you have never seen in your life. May God bless you and may God keep you. Amen.